everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're bringing you out for a 9 a.m. class on a Saturday morning, so, uh, and I know this involves uh, also leaving sleeping students uh, to, to be here, so we appreciate uh, that you came. Um, I just wanted to note that um, if you didn't know this already, there's coffee um, and other things available for you in the Welcome Center, which is just right next door in the Campus Center, right? I have that. Yeah, in the Campus Center. So um, we didn't have it right out here, but it's, it's very close for that caffeine uh, fix after this, if, if, uh, if you want to go get it. So um, my name's Maud Mandel. I'm the Dean of the College here at Brown. I'm also a professor of history and Judaic studies. Um, I've been at Brown about 20 years, and I've been Dean for uh, just over two years. Um, so I speak to you today from the position as Dean, of course, to talk a, a lot about um, the kinds of opportunities that are available to your student here at Brown, um, and also how to navigate through that open curriculum, which I know is a bit mysterious, particularly for parents who are one step removed from what's happening um, here on campus, and often your students come to you for advice, but um, it's easier to be informative and helpful if you actually know something about what's going on. So uh, I'm going to try to give you a quick version of what I told your students in orientation. So right after you left, we had an orientation session, and I did a longer version of what I'm going to do for you here today, um, just to give you a basic introduction into the kinds of things they were told quite honestly, so that you can reinforce some of the things I told them, which they promptly forgot, because they were busy getting to know each other and the excitement of matriculating to Brown. So, so I'm, I'm using you as, a, as an aid in my uh, getting information out to the students' um, process. Uh, I also wanted to mention, um, and I will at the end uh, give an opportunity to um, the large number of staff who are in the room, mostly sitting in this area over here, um, who, <coughs> excuse me, either during the question and answer session um, or at the end will be available to take some, some of your specific questions around particular issues that might come up uh, as we go forward. Um, I'm actually hoping not to talk too long at you. Um, I've always preferred the seminar style of teaching as a professor, so um, I at a certain point will stop and really open the floor to your questions so that I can really um, target my answers to the things that you're worrying about or curious about or interested in. Um, but some, I'll do some broad overview points uh, first. So um, I want to just lay out some of the key questions facing Brown students when they get here, and particularly in their first two years, uh, and, and perhaps that are on your mind um, as well. Um, so this is, of course, one of the big ones right from uh, the moment students arrive. How do I narrow down my choices? There are 2,000 courses, give or take, uh, in the Brown course catalog. You get to pick four a semester. Um, this can be a very challenging um, experience, particularly when there are no distribution requirements forcing a student to go in a particular direction. Um, how can I get more focused advising? We're going to talk about this. This might be on your minds. Um, I know students um, struggle with uh, how to find the kind of advice and advising that they need, um, and I promise we're going to address that. Um, how do I select my concentration? We really don't force students to do this to the end of their sophomore year, but students really are worrying about it before they even uh, start here in September of their first year, so we're going to talk just a little bit about that process as well. Um, where can I find information on internships, research opportunities, study abroad? I'm going to talk about that lightly in the presentation, um, but also, as I said, I have representatives here from the Office of International Programs, from Career Lab, uh, from the Swear Center for Public Service. A lot of our different offices are represented here, so you can ask questions about that if you have particular questions as well. This is usually the one the parents are most worried about. How can I assure I will someday be employable? We're going to talk about that a little bit as well, um, and how you can position your Brown education to help you with that. Um, let's start with, this is a slide I show in the orientation, and it really focuses on the question of how should I narrow my academic choices. So this is broad advice. It obviously needs to be tailored to each individual student, um, but all of it's really important, and I want to talk through it. So let me start with the explore your passion. So actually, we throw this phrase around a lot at Brown. I left it on my slide because somebody will inevitably have said it to your student. I actually don't like the phrase myself. Um, I re-articulate it to my advisees as I turn it into a question. And the question I ask the students is, what are you interested in? What are you curious about? What do you want to learn more about that you have a question about, that you don't know? 
Um, exploring your passions can be pretty daunting to somebody who's 18 years old or 17 or 19. Um, some of them have passions. Uh, a lot of them have um, fleeting passions uh, at this age and maybe even later. So um, I think passions is actually a bit scary. But what are you interested in? What are you curious about? And when I start my advising meetings with students, and particularly we now have a very, very robust course selection tool where you can literally type words in and any, any course that connects to your area of interest will pop up around that word. Um, so for example, I'll just use one I used in uh, a presentation yesterday. Um, a student said to me, food. She was interested in food. So I typed, food was something she was curious about. I mean, this was, this was even further back than what do you want to study in college, right? This was just, what are, what, are, what are your hobbies? What do you like to talk about? What do you like to explore? So we typed food into the course guide, and all kinds of really interesting things came up around the history um, of you know, ancient traditions in China, also a chemistry class on, um, ki in, called kitchen chemistry. Right? So there were a whole range of things, and it was a way really just to get a conversation started, not necessarily she was going to take those courses, but really to make the point that really, in an open curriculum, the place to start is what do you want to know more about, especially at the beginning when they're not yet making focused concentration decisions. They're just really beginning to understand what's out there. Um, a second area that we often encourage them to do is to build on strengths. So they've come to a school with an open curriculum, particularly in the first year. It's good to push yourself and challenge yourself, but it's also good to think about what you were good at uh, in high school and to begin to think about that as an area you might get better in. Um, it doesn't mean you have to study exactly the way you studied it in high school. We would encourage you to, to, to challenge yourself beyond those boundaries, but to think about the, the areas of strength. And, and this is really um, an easy thing to do in a school with an open curriculum, um, because we're not saying you have to go study the things you're not good at. We actually also encourage you to do that, which I'll get to. But, um, but you really can think about what are you good at, what are you interested in, and what are you good at, and how can you uh, fuse those together. Um, now, almost a contradictory point, um, we, we also encourage students to take risks. So how this, how this plays out in an advising meeting with a student uh, when I'm talking to them at the beginning of the semester is if you think that you get to pick four courses uh, in a particular semester, you might think about doing it in the following way. What is an area you think that you're curious about and you want to learn more about, which might eventually end up being a concentration someday, right? What is, what is something you're curious about? And that might be, say, um, two of your courses, right? Something that you're, and it might be two areas, especially for a first year who doesn't know what direction they want to go in. They say, well, I'm interested in poetry, um, and I'm interested in neuroscience, so great. You know, you take, some, take something in core areas you're interested in. And then a, for a third course, I might say, um, what is a skill you really want to develop while you're brown? And we'll come back to this. Um, and, you know, somebody might say, well, you know, I was a pretty good writer, but I have some work to do on writing. Or um, data analysis is something that scares me, but um, I really think I should get better at that. So then I might suggest a kind of a skills-based course, computer programming course uh, that's focused on problem solving or, um, or a writing course. And then for the fourth one, and this gets me to the taking risk, um, I really strongly encourage first year, second year students, and actually, honestly, all students all the way through, if they have room in their schedules, to take a course that you can frame it in different ways, that's outside your comfort zone, might be one way to frame it, that it requires taking an intellectual risk into an area that maybe you don't know exactly what it is. Um, and, and for me, really what I like to encourage students to do is um, to ask the question, which department do I skip over when I'm going through the course guide because I don't know what it is. Not the ones you skip over because you really aren't interested. That's okay. There are courses you're not interested in. I, I went to a school with an open curriculum and there were departments I avoided because honestly they weren't in my strength area. And I knew that if I took a course in that area, it was just gonna be an unpleasant and terrible experience. But there were other things that, and I, and I, this is a sort of do what I say, not what I did instruction to students. There were other departments I avoided because I just didn't know what they were. Um, so I really like to encourage Brown students to spend some time in the, in the course guide, in our online course tool, looking at the departments where they don't know what they are and trying to ask themselves, am I curious about it? If I knew what this was, maybe I would be curious about it. So how can they take an intellectual risk to push the boundaries? 
um, I had the pleasure of uh, attending a dinner with some Brown students the other night, and one of the students said at the dinner that she had come in knowing exactly what she wanted to study uh, at Brown. So this is a first year who arrived six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, whenever that was, um, and that now she doesn't know it all, and she's so excited because she loves all her courses, um, and it's sort of blown apart what she thought she wanted to do. Um, but that was great because the reason it had happened was she had done this. She had taken courses in areas she had never heard of. Um, and it, it, you know, the thing is, you don't know what you don't know is one of the things I always say to students. And when you're that age, there's a lot you don't know. I mean, quite honestly, there's a lot you don't know at every age, right? We are, we are all lifelong learners. But at this age, you're coming out of pretty narrow um, field of educational vision. Uh, and coming to Brown can sort of blow that open. Uh, and so taking risks is a really important. So you can hear in the advice that um, I'm trying to frame for students, particularly in the first year and second year, um, it's really an approach more than make sure you take the following classes or you go into these departments or you find this professor, but rather an approach to thinking about what are you interested in, what skills do you want to develop, what intellectual risks are you going to take? and using that as a framework for thinking about how, because honestly, again, picking four out of 2,000, there's, there's no right answer. There's no, nobody's gonna hand them a formula. They have to figure out what's right for them, and this is a, a sort of a map or a, a toolkit for thinking about how to do that. Okay, so um, in an open curriculum, uh, it's really important, even all schools assign students advisors. But in a school with an open curriculum, having an advisor is an essential um, part of that toolkit. Um, and, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. <coughs> One of the, um, the, I think, disservices that um, perhaps all universities do for students, but Brown does as well, is we sign your student an advisor upon arrival. So they get a, a professor and a peer Mickle John tutors, they actually get two. But the advisor, the grown up, the fa usually a faculty member or advanced high level staff, um, is assigned as the advisor. And the reason this is a disservice, if you think about your life and times you have to make de decisions where there's a cornucopia of choices, you never go to one person who gives you, tells you what to do, and then you follow that instruction. You just don't get advice. That's not what advice is. What you do when you're trying to make a difficult decision is you get advice from lots of different sources. Um, and so uh, the same is true for an academic advisor at Brown. It is one source. So what is an advisor? An advisor is not the source of all information. And this is when I say I'm using your, you to help me get a message to the students. Many of your students will say, oh, you know, I'm interested in physics. My advisor is a political scientist. Um, he doesn't know anything about the physics department. And he's really busy. And I can only get in there you know, once, once every two months. Um, and I don't know what to do. So the answer to that is build your advising team. Add people to the advising team because the advisor is simply a conversation partner and a resource, just like you are. You are part of your student's advising team. Um, you probably wish that they would do exactly what you told them to do, uh, but they won't do that. You're one person that they come to advice for. Their advisor is somebody else they come to advice for. Um, and I will talk a bit about how to build an advising team, um, but the, the students, that because they've chosen a school that has an open curriculum, really need to feel empowered to think about how you pull together that network of advisors. Because one thing we say over and over again at Brown is life is an open curriculum. So when they leave here, and they have a jump on this from their peers at other schools, they're going to have practiced for four years figuring out how you make difficult choices when you don't know what to do and nobody has the answer for you. Likewise, that's what's going to happen in life. They will build an advising team in life, people they'll talk to, spouses and children and friends and colleagues um, and, and business associates they meet, et cetera, um, in order to figure out how to make difficult choices. So how can your student find the additional advising resources that, um, that he or she needs in order to navigate this, uh, this process? Because this is the hard part. I think the students hear me when I say you need to build an advising team. But then what a lot of them will say back is, oh, but you know, how do I do that? I'm, uh, you know, and and it's, is it my place? And who, who wants to talk to me anyway? I mean, I, you know, I'm not important enough for that. So we have a couple of, of um, pieces of information I wanted to share for you. Um, and I'm going to just show you a couple tools. Some of them you may be aware of. OK, this came up on my screen, but not yours. That's not good. 
Any? I have to do what? Okay. We didn't talk about that. Hold on. Did it pop up? Okay, great. Thank you. So, can you see this? All right. So, what focal point? How many of you have you have ever seen focal point? Not very many. Okay. So, this is important for you to be aware of. So, this focal point is a tool we make available to Brown undergrads that has every Brown concentration on it. So, I know it's not going to be super easy to see, but you'll be able to see. So, if I um, I'm just going to pick one for the purposes of the presentation. Um, let's pick my own department. There we go, history. So when I click on history, what you'll see here is a description of the concentration, links to the department website, and very importantly, the requirements uh, for the concentration. But most importantly for this presentation, if you look on the right-hand side under the category advisors, if you see that, um, what is that? Those are, pit, those are faculty in the department whose job it is to meet with students who want to think about concentrating in history or have a question about history, or really a question just about being an undergraduate at Brown, they hold open office hours and students can go talk to them. Now, I, when I made this presentation, I think two years ago to a bunch of students, a, student, a first year said to me, oh, I didn't know I was allowed to go talk to them because they're concentration advisors. But of course, anybody, excuse me, <coughs> can go talk to them. And, that, and they should add somebody from the concentrations they're considering to their advising team. And if they decide not to concentrate in that, they don't have to go back. But, and if they go to meet with one person and that person isn't very forthcoming or all that friendly, they should go to somebody else. That is a, the practice of finding the people that you need to be the kind of resource um, in the process of getting the advice you need. So they can go into particular departments. Um, so if they were assigned an advisor, from a field that they either no longer want to study or really never wanted to study, there are plenty of people in the fields they do want to study that they can go talk to and that they should feel empowered to go talk to. Okay, we'll talk about focal point uh, again in a minute for some another reason, but um, I did want to show you, well, we'll do that later. Okay, so let me go back now though to the um, slideshow here. Okay. Um, Okay, so focal point is one place to find advisors. Another place to find advisors is office hours. So by office hours, I mean your students enrolled in four classes probably, um, and all of those courses are taught by faculty. Those faculty hold open office hours every single week. Um, often students in those courses, particularly when they're big, feel like they're not supposed to go to office hours um, unless they have a question about, oh, I got a C on the test, how do I get a B or an A? Um, or uh, the midterm is conflicts with my um, tennis match, you know, what do I do, right? Like a really a, a focused question or a problem to bring to the faculty member. Um, that's one of the things the faculty will do if you go meet with them, but the faculty are sitting there often, I have experienced this many times for many hours uh, answering emails when students aren't coming, um, but if students come, uh, the faculty can talk to them about anything. And one of the things, and some of you have heard me say this, but it bears repeating, that I tell students to do, because the students will say, well, I don't know what to talk about. If I, you know, if I don't have a problem, why would they want to talk to me? My advice to them uh, repeatedly is, go ask them why they became a historian. Ask them why they're a biologist. What interests them about organic chemistry? Ask them about themselves, because people love to talk about themselves. So if you go ask a professor a question about him or herself, you will start a conversation, and that's how you get the person in your advising team. Now you have a rapport, a conversation started, maybe the person who they have even the slightest ability at conversational exchange will then ask a question back. That usually happens. Faculty expect to be the answerer of questions in these exchanges, not, um, uh, not, and, and therefore po will pose questions. And so that's just a, another little tool that students can use <coughs> to use these open office hours um, and to begin to add someone to their team, even if they don't know exactly what to ask. But they can also ask, you know, I'm taking your course, I'm finding it a little hard, but I'm really interested in chemistry what would you suggest I take next? Or, um, I'm interested in your course, but I'm curious how another discipline addresses this from a different direction. What would you suggest? The worst that could happen is the faculty person, this is literally the worst thing that could happen. The faculty person will say, I don't know. 
That's the worst that could happen, right? But likely is not. The faculty person would like to talk. Faculty people like to talk. Faculty like to talk. They will probably think of it some kind of advice. And it might or might not be useful, but the students will add that to what they're collecting. Um, in university halls sit a huge number of um, assistant and associate deans that work in the dean of the college. Uh, and we hold open office hours. I'm not going to go off the presentation to go to the link. But if you um, Google, Office hour, open office hours, dean of the college, Brown University. There's a web page <coughs> that lays out um, every single dean, excuse me, <coughs> their office hours, um, who it is, when their office hours are available. And these are drop in hours. Students do not need appointments. And the deans are there precisely to answer questions about how to navigate the open curriculum, how to make difficult decisions, should I take a class pass fail, should I drop a class. Uh, I started in this department, I thought I was going to be pre-med, and now I've decided I want to go into politics. What do I do? I mean, th that's exactly what these appointments are for. Um, so this is a, so I like to say to students, you should have a dean in your advising team. Most students think, are scared of deans, um, or they don't know what a dean is. But deans actually, that's all we are, that we're advisors. So, <coughs> um, so that's another resource that's available to your students. And we also have the Curricular Resource Center, which is um, a center in um, a, an office in the um, Fonts Hall right next door, which is um, a peer mentor, a peer-led student advising group, essentially, um, that can help um, guide students in all kinds of areas of, do you want to do an independent concentration or an independent study or group independent study? Um, they run a sophomore mentoring program where they pair a sophomore I'm sorry, an, an upperclassman with a sophomore in a kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, mentoring, advising relationship. Um, so uh, this is another resource, um, and again, another person the students can add um, to their team. Okay, selecting a concentration. So let's talk about what is a concentration. You probably have a point of view about this, but I'm, I'm gonna hopefully disabuse you too. So hey, what is a concentration? Or this is our word for a major at Brown. Um, same thing though, essentially. So what is it? So for starters, a concentration is a mode of inquiry. It's a typically, not always, but it's typically a discipline um, that uh, a person can study, right? It's history or it's physics or it's art history or it's philosophy, et cetera. So it's a mode of inquiry. Another way of putting that, it is a mode of asking questions uh, about a topic, which is really what disciplines are. It's an approach for invest, it's a set of questions for investigating a topic. A concentration is also a pathway through the curriculum, and this is really important. Um, we are a school with no distribution requirements, but we do have requirements, and those requirements come from signing up through a concentration. The map that, that is created for students who sign up for a concentration is um, predetermined then by the faculty in that department who believe that if you're going to be a historian the, or a budding historian, these are the courses you should take uh, that would prepare you for that. Um, if we didn't have concentrations and we had just take any 32 courses throughout your entire time at Brown, um, the students would have no maps, right? And, and in fact, we have fewer maps than other schools because schools with distribution requirements provide those maps. Um, but this is a map through a particular mode of inquiry where the advanced faculty in the field have determined what is a um, reasonable direction through the vast amount of data and material um, that that discipline studies. Um, it's also a first step, and I really want to highlight this, in narrowing down interest. So this is something that's really important that I stress to students, um, and it was a really important lesson to me in college. When you concentrate in something, um, you don't become a specialist in that thing, actually. Uh, you're lucky if you've learned the tiniest tip of the iceberg about what that field has to offer. I remember in college I took a course on Milton, and I spent 13 weeks doing nothing but reading poetry about Milton that he'd written, and then criticism about him. And the biggest thing I learned out of that class that I remember thinking very passionately when I left was, oh my goodness, I have done nothing but study this one person for 13 weeks, and I know nothing yet about everything that he wrote and did and what people wrote about him. That was really a powerful <laughs> lesson for me in college. Likewise, a concentration is just the beginning of that inquiry of getting, and so there is no way in a concentration you're going to come out a master of that thing. So what have you accomplished by concentrating in something? You've started to get a sense of what it means to dig deeper in one area. So it's really important. Instead of sort of 32 courses just um, superficially, it's saying, okay, if you're going to go in one direction, this is the kind of what it would look like 
to begin the process of going deeper. Process of going deeper. So whatever you do after you leave Brown, even if it's not in this field, you have a sense already of what it means to start going deeper into a topic. And this is another very important point. This is one pathway to professional life after Brown. It is, so I'm going to put it there for, for some fields. If you're pre-med and you take the pre-med requirements, you can probably, if, uh, if they go well and you do other things, go to medical school. Um, and so it can be a pathway, uh, although you don't have to concentrate, you don't concentrate in your pre-med requirements, but it can be, be sometimes, if you're an education concentrator and decide you want to be a teacher, um, if you're a history concentrator and decide you want to be a professor of history, of course it can be a pathway to employment. Um, but <clears throat> I really like to push back on this one with students as well. Um, how many people in this room are doing a profession that's directly linked to what you majored in in college? Actually, it's a pretty big number. You and I ask this question it's smaller usually, but still, it is not. It is not even half the room, or even a quarter of the room, I believe. Um, very. Uh, um, what we know to be true from the data, and I will uh, come back to this in a moment, is. Um, that uh, no matter what you concentrate in at Brown, um, you're going to end up uh, doing pretty well in life one way or another. There is a job that will follow or a graduate education that will follow. Um, so while this is one pathway to future employment, it is, is the least important point um, about a concentration. It really doesn't, you really can't make a mistake. It's not, it, it is not a life-changing moment deciding what concentration. Uh, our students carry the burden very heavily. Um, but the truth is, it, it doesn't matter that much. It's just going slightly deeper in one area than another, um, as I've been suggesting. So it is not the only pathway to empl employment. And here is um, often my favorite uh, slide to show. So we're going to do that now. But let me, this is, we're going to take us back to, oh, I had forgot again to do this. So we're going to go back to focal point. Um, and I just want to show you a fun tool. So first, before I go to my pathway to employment, let me show you one really wonderful feature of focal point. Um, if you look at the right side, uh, well, my right side, uh, over the, uh, yeah, yours too, the, um, uh, uh, the, your interest in Life After Brown, look what happens. We're just going to have some fun here. So in the Life After Brown category, I'm going to click, let's see, when I leave Brown, I'm thinking I might want to possibly do something in the arts and communication and media. So what's going to happen is all the concentrations which might lead possibly in that direction, according to the faculty, to something in that area, which might not be self-evident, i.e. this is not a direct line, right? Um, and, and where does this come from? Is this data from their graduates? Where did their graduates go? What did they go on to do? They concentrated in these things. Um, and among other things, this is where they went. So you might not have expected Slavic studies um, or um, uh, visual art maybe in this case would make sense. You might have expected that. You know, you might not have for Latin American and Caribbean studies. Let's just do another one for fun, um, just because it is fun. <laughs> um, how about, let's see, well, this is a great one, right? Let's say you want to, let's do finance and banking. Everybody likes to see that one. Okay, it's actually a smaller number, right? But still pretty good there. Look at that. And it's not just economics and applied math. It's really important, right? Oh my goodness, Slavic studies. Look what popped up, right? French and Francophone studies. And I'm going to show you an even more powerful uh, indication of this data, but <laughs> your students can play with that. They can also do it in, um, on the learning interest, so on the your interest section. So back to my point, what are you interested in? If you don't know departments and you haven't heard of a particular department, but you really know you're interested in um, evaluating human behavior, you know, what departments and concentrations allow you to do that? Or if you're interested in problem solving, you know, where, what are the departments that allow you to do that? Um, and, uh, and so you, you're, th that's a fun tool to play with for students um, uh, that you can enjoy. By the way, that I had two things clicked there, so that's why there were so number, so few. Okay, now I want to show you something interesting. So we're going to go into economics first. Okay, so we have a lot of economics concentrators. And if you slide down on the... Um, page here, you will see alumni pathways. Under the graduating class there, you'll see alumni pathways. And um, if you follow the link to see more details on the Career Lab website, this is going to take me to a link in the Career Lab website, which is going to show what people who part graduated in economics did right after graduating Brown for the last two years. Is that right? Where are you? Three years. 
Okay, so we can find. So, okay, maybe not so surprising. A lot of economics concentrators ended up on Wall Street, right? Not so surprising. So just not, not exclusively. We have an adjunct professor of dance um, who was an economics concentrator, okay? Um, so you're gonna find things like that, but it's also not particularly surprising to discover this very, very long list of folks who ended up uh, going to Wall Street. Also, graduate school. That's also not a particularly surprising outcome. Okay, so now I wanna show you uh, the reason I really brought up this tool though. Let me show you, somebody tell me a department where you're really worried. <laughs> Your student wants to concentrate in it and you're worried about it leading to gainful employment. History, History. thank you, yes, that's a scary one. <laughs> okay, so, um, let me find it. I'm sorry, am I not wearing my glasses? Where, oh, there I am, okay. So history. Now it has fewer concentrators, although it's still a pretty po popular concentration. Oh my God, they all went to Wall Street. <laughs> and I say this not because I think all brown students should go to Wall Street. And actually a lot of these students will go for a year and then go find out that they want to go do something else because life is an open curriculum and they'll try it and find out that's not for them or, it's, or another opportunity will emerge. And the history students aren't entirely on Wall Street. They're gonna be a little bit less so. If I scan down, you would find all kinds of other things in here. Editors, people on um, not-for-profit years you know, abroad. They're gonna do, they end up doing a, a broader range. But I, I show you the data largely to make the point that a liberal arts education prepares you for anything. And so they can concentrate in anything and still go on. Now true, if you want a PhD in history, it's a good idea to concentrate in history. It's not, impo actually wasn't a history concentrator myself in college, I was an English major and I ended up pulling off a PhD in history, but that's a harder path. If you want a PhD in something, if you're not gonna study in college, you're probably gonna end up having to get a master's these days um, in that subject if you didn't choose it or really spend a lot of time on it. So it's not like there's no connection, but in terms of just sort of the basic question of what's going to happen after Brown, and if you look at the history concentrators, very small numbers go on to PhDs, but if you look, there are still plenty um, who've gone on either to a master's program, some to PhD, some to medical school, right? Because again, you can concentrate in history uh, and, and go on to be a doctor, um, arts and uh, um, museum studies, et cetera. So I could do this for every department. Some departments, the data is less, as, as was a good choice history because we have a lot of students. Some departments just have fewer students. So you, the data is not quite as shocking just because it's, you know, Slavic studies, if I had pulled that up, you know, might have two students a year. So they're also gonna end up somewhere, but it's employed somewhere. Um, but we wouldn't be as powerful up in making the point which is that a liberal arts education prepares you to do anything. And what you do here doesn't just involve the classes you take, it involves what you do with your summers, um, the networking you're doing outside of Brown, um, and there's all kinds of ways, excuse me, <coughs> that you take your education forward with you uh, upon leaving here. Okay, we can leave that now. Go back to this, I'm almost done with what I'm gonna say to you. Um, Okay, so just a few resources, um, and what I, I, I've only listed some of them here, um, and uh, when I listed, if the, if the dean who is, or uh, a director who's associated with it could just stand up um, so folks could see you and you could say your name, and again, they're not all listed here. So study abroad, Ned, can you stand up and wave? So Ned is here, and again, we can, you, if you have questions about this in the Q&A, you can ask me, but if we don't get to everything, Ned can answer questions after this uh, as well. Um, com community Service and Engagement, which is put in the, in the Swear Center. Matthew Johnson, who's the director of the Swear Center, who actually can't stay for questions after this session, but if you have questions, there's another session in the Swear Center right after that, and also I can answer questions uh, around that. Internships and research opportunities is gonna, is, we have two people, <laughs> so uh, Ola Duratimi Adetunji, who uh, handles research opportunities, um, and Matt Donato, who's the director of Career Lab, um, and, can, and also has another event on, specifically on internships right after this session. Um, but also I can answer questions about that. Health careers, pre-professional advising office. Uh, Good morning, George. George uh, runs that um, and can answer questions about that. Um, fellowships, I don't know if Linda, oh, Linda's here, I didn't see you, sorry. Linda Dunlavy, my apologies, Linda, um, who runs ours, so that's Fulbright's, um, 
roads, Marshall Fellows, uh, things of that nature. That's really important because often students don't even know what those are. So have, thinking early about how one might position for those kinds of post Brown fellowships uh, is great. Um, and then um, we have, I don't have it listed here, but we have a number of people here who are re representing um, undergraduate advising. So if, uh, well, actually all the deans do that, but um, if uh, Yoli and Carol could just stand up, particularly focused on first year um, and sophomore advising uh, and can answer questions about that. And Shannon uh, O'Neill, who uh, focuses on um, upper class um, junior and senior issues. I, Family Weekend tends to focus more on underclassmen, but if you have issues about uh, upper class questions, um, she can do that. And Dave Targan, who represents the Science Center. If you have undergraduate here um, and a really undergraduate science study at Brown more broadly, um, if you have questions about that. Um, and uh, Renicia Eli, who uh, is a dean who helps uh, ad advise students from um, high need uh, financial backgrounds. Questions about that? Who have I left out? Did I miss anybody? Oh, Besenia um, and Moitri. Yes, so Besenia Rodriguez is the um, senior dean for um, curricular programs uh, and can talk to you about um, essentially the Brown, uh, the broad Brown advising network. Um, and Moitri Bhattacharya, who oversees um, diversity programs uh, in our unit. But everybody here, uh, and Mary Wright, um, who is the director of our um, uh, Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, which also oversees tutoring and the writing center, and the deputy dean of the college, Chris Dennis, who pretty much does everything. So, <laughs> so if you have questions about any of this, uh, you can go and talk to him. I think I got everybody. I hope I didn't leave anybody out, but the point is there are a lot of folks here who can answer specific questions, as can I uh, from the stage, but if we run out of time, um, they're really happy to answer these questions, and they all do first year and sophomore advising. So you don't, if you have broad questions about that, they can talk to you uh, about that. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, what I always like to say before question and answer sessions is everybody has a question. So take a second and think about what your question is. Um, you don't have to ask it, but this is a good time to ask it. So take a minute and think about what your question is. Um, we have a little tool we play with here. I'm not sure we have enough people here to use it, but I like it so much, I'm gonna try. Um, this is my tossable mic. And um, so the, the way I like to play this game, since I said that everybody has a question, is I'm just gonna throw this into the audience and whoever gets it should ask a question. So there's some pressure. I do this in my classes without a tossable mic. Everybody has a question, then I point to a student and say, ask your question. So take five seconds, <laughs> think about what your question's gonna be. <coughs> Did that make people nervous? <laughs> there are, you know what we say, there are no dumb questions. Oh, somebody's even volunteering, very well. And we will, then that gives the rest of you some time to think about it. Um, I'm going to toss this to you, but it's not going to make it. So pass it back to the gentleman who's, stand, who's about to stand up to catch it. <laughs> oh, pretty close. Oh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it's a pillow. It's not going to hurt anybody. Okay. I'm not planning to wound you. Okay. Yeah. So just talk into the black circle. Do I talk into this? Yep, oh, you wow, do. That's pretty cool. It is. How progressive. Yes. Thank you. Developed by Brown students who study <laughs> no engineering, doubt. I take no it. No right? doubt, yes. So okay. my question is, in creating a balanced curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, students here are, are uh, very focused on what they want to do, so they want to get all the concentration stuff out of the way first. Yes. So they miss the opportunity <laughs> of looking at the bigger picture, 60,000 foot view. What is your thought? What's your recommendation? Every student is different. Right. Um, and students that we've talked to who graduated from Brown said, if I was to do it all over again, I would not focus early on. I would focus in later. Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you can hold the mic for a sec there. Um, so, uh, look, if I had my preference, if I got to advise every single Brown student, I would say, go start broad and then go narrow. Like, you know, in other words, ideally, educationally, you would survey what's out there figure out your interests, change your mind, narrow your choices, do it again, pick, specialize, because as you know, you've gone on to be professionals, you spend your life as a specialist. This is actually the rare moment in life where you can spend a little time just with the joy of being a generalist, with exploring. Um, and those moments pass very quickly. So again, if I, if I had my druthers, I would say, please, go broad to narrow. Um, there are some fields where that's difficult, um, and so if you're coming to Brown to be an engineer, you have 21 concentration requirements. The students know it, we pair them right away with an engineering 
um, advisor, and unless they decide not to be an engineer, they really have no choice. They're going to have to start being very focused. Some of the heavy STEM fields, again, it's a toss-up. If you're going to be a STEM concentrator, you might have 15 or 17, um, or in, in the case of engineering, 21 requirements, which just by definition limits um, the exploration. But we have a lot of students who don't know what they want to do, um, and, the, uh, and the, set, the fear that they're somehow going to miss out if they don't immediately dig in and focus is misplaced for the most part. Um, I mean, the, again, the worst that can happen for lots of concentrations is you find your, for lack of a better word, passion. You find the thing you're really interested in late, and then you really have to turn your last two years into a very, very intensely focused um, investigation of that thing. But that's not so bad then, right? Because then you're really beginning to specialize, starting that process. Um, but it is true that there are certain fields where that's a bit of an issue. Dave, you want to say something? You should use the mic. Yeah, hi. John. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to put a little finer point on what uh, Dean Mandel is saying, um, it's also not just the quantity of courses in the physical sciences, or especially in engineering, uh, which has the most required courses. Um, it's also kind of the, what, what I call the vertical structure of courses um, and curricula. So, in uh, physics, uh, chemistry, some other sciences as well. Um, it would be very important in the first year to take uh, certain courses that will uh, be required because they're prerequisites in later years. So um, while uh, you can put off uh, some subject matters that have a lot of courses till even you know second semester, sophomore year, um, you really want to make sure in that first year that you're taking critical courses that are prerequisites for later courses. So your job is to throw the mic, and somebody will catch it and ask a question. Oh, it looks like there's a question right in front of you. I'll follow on, oh, if yes. I may. Yes, so um, coming from the generation where what you studied is what you ended up doing, yes. um, we can be assured that things will be OK. Well, I showed you the data. <laughs> OK. So that, I'm an that's really the point of the question. <laughs> so I'm a historian, and I'm not really an empiric empirical historian. Um, but the data is pretty compelling, right? So, um, and the broad data about Brown students five years out and 10 years out, uh, we are overwhelmingly not just employed, but well employed, right? So Brown students go on to do very well. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be dismissive of one point, which is, um, and there are all kinds of students from particular, a whole range of backgrounds who have very specific goals. I don't mean necessarily professional goals, but, you know, that this, we often see this in some of our high-need families where there's, you know, there's a need to support family financially upon leaving, and they're targeting particular professions precisely um, in order to address those kinds of needs and issues. So the data shows that you're going to end up employed. If you, if you know for sure you want to do a particular field, there are obviously ways to prepare you for that field. But even if you're going to prepare yourself for that field, there's a whole wealth of um, open learning you can do. Because you don't know what you're going to change your mind about later. Um, and learning the requisite skills that are built into a liberal arts education, reading, writing, research, data analysis, problem solving, communication, there is no field that doesn't require research. There is no field that doesn't require writing. Every field, you're going to have to be a problem solver. So you can learn those skills in practically any Brown course and develop them over the time you're here. So in short, yes, they'll be fine. <laughs> uh, I think um, you have inherited yeah, the microphone. I, I'm, I'm curious uh, about students, especially freshmen, who may be floundering mm -hmm. academically. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you have? sort of an action plan for students that are yes. off track? Yep. And which students do you identify? And, and, and how, do you, how do you get them back on track if, if they're at risk? Yeah, great question. And by the way, uh, it happens all the time. That's superstar students in high school who come to Brown, and it's not the same. And it takes some time to get used to being in college. They were straight A students, and suddenly there's a C on the transcript, and they're really nervous. Um, one of the things you can do as parents is reassure them that a C in your first year of college is not going to end up in the unemployment line. Uh, I, I got some, not just one, I got more than one C in my first year of college. And look, I'm dean of the College of Brown. I tell them that story every time. It still worked out. Um, I didn't get C straight through, right? I figured it out. And this goes to your point, actually, about what do you do to support students who are struggling. Cause, so we have a number of ways we catch students. Um, faculty have the ability to tell us at the middle of the semester through um, an electronic uh, checking system. They'll go through their course, course roster, and if a student's really 
um, struggling, uh, and uh, essentially an automatic message will be sent to our office, and academic deans will reach out to students. Very often, st students themselves will reach out for help. Um, and again, you can be very helpful here. If your student is struggling um, and you know about it, sending them to our open office hours is the important first step, because getting them in with a dean who has the um, access to all of the tools and information the student needs for, to find the resources and the help they need um, is a really important first step, because we can't help anybody we don't know about. So either the faculty tell us, maybe a first year advisor might tell us, or the student will tell us. But if other, we, you know, we're not gonna, we don't go through the grades ourselves to, to try to find those students, so we need, we need a way in. But once we've heard of their student, there are tons of support resources. We have a writing center uh, where students can get um, support on writing. We have a tutoring center, which does group tutoring for some of the big introductory math and science courses where students often need extra support. Both of those, as I mentioned, are under the Sheridan Center um, under Mary Wright, and in, that's in the um, sciences library, the, the writing center, and the tutoring office. We have a student support service, uh, which is an academic support service, which actually will peer, pair a student with an academic um, mentor. Is that how you would describe it? A coach, that's our, the word, right, a coach, uh, who will work one-on-one -on -one with that student on study skills and um, deep reading skills and sort of how to, time management and how do you master time management a lot of first-year students really struggle with and, so, and second as well. Um, and so, um, so we have a lot of resources that are available. The Science Center does specific um, support for students in those fields. Uh, so we have a, really, we have a, a robust system of support, but we need to know that the student is struggling. Thank you. Um, it looks like there's a question here. You want to do some tossing? Thank you. Sorry, my skills are not that good. Um, I'm very familiar with Brown. I have two recent, well, relatively recent Brown grads. Wonderful. And my third son is here. And one of the trends I'm noticing um, is that it's increasingly getting difficult getting into small seminars. Mm. Uh, my son's now a sophomore, and he didn't get any of the first, second, third choices, fall, spring yes. <laughs> of fresh. And I said, don't worry, it'll happen <coughs> sophomore year. You'll get the small seminar. Um, and I'm wondering, is, are there any options for them to come sort of see you guys and say, because he's hung out in the professor's classroom, sometimes now they're saying, oh, we have a waiting list of, I'm not sure why this is happening. I'm also a Brown grad and, yeah. you know, this is just getting worse and worse and not to be, you know, no, just that's fine. I curious. Yeah. So um, a couple of things. Um, I actually think sophomore year is the hardest. I'm, I'm sorry that he had a struggle first year. Usually most first years can find a first year seminar that has space and most, um, an overwhelming majority of first-year students take a first-year seminar. Sophomore year is the hardest. We have some targeted sophomore seminars, um, which always have spaces in them. So, but there are a few, only a few of them. So he may not be interested in those subjects. But there are usually there are what 15 this year. Bethany, is that about right? 15 sophomore seminars, some right. of which are in the spring. Um, they're the hardest because you have a lot of first-year seminars and a lot of junior and seniors. It gets easier to get in as you get older. So sophomore is actually the hardest period. Um, but the other thing I would say, and um, there are 10, I was gonna say tens, I'm, I'm trying to think of something between hundreds and tens, right? There, there are many, many, many upper level seminars that are not full at Brown, many. Um, and uh, and it, so the question is finding the class where there's space that coincides with the interest of the student. The classes that fill up, you know, uh, a seminar on global terrorism, right, is going to fill up in the first second, and there's going to be a waiting list of 150 people. Um, the seminar in uh, Milton that I took in college, not going to be full. You're going to be able to get in that seminar. So there's a lot of actually <coughs> options, and what I would say is I don't have a magic wand where in my office we could get him into a class that's closed, but we do um, have excellent advising in those open, open office hours, and I think they could work with him to find the courses that have spaces and see if they can match those with his interest. It might require some of that taking risks that I mentioned, stretching outside the comfort zone to say, in order to get a small class, would you be willing to go into this area that you might not have considered before? So, but I recommend he comes to open office hours. Okay, and we probably have time for one more question. Is that right? Where's Carol? I've lost Carol. <laughs> Yes, one more? Okay, one more. Um, there's some I hands. I trust my growing. Um, there, that's okay. You can pass it back. There's some questions. There are hands up uh, in, the, 
in the back there. Just toss it across the aisle. Just toss it. Really, it can't hurt you. And then toss it back. Woo-wee! Good. Wonderful. See, it's fun. Okay, you go. I, I have a question back to the sort of open curriculum. And I have to say, our son has already been seduced by the humanities, and that's fantastic. Love he that. loves it. Great. But what about the STEM subjects? It, a lot of course, a lot of universities with core curricula are, I, I think, maybe thinking about bringing people into them. Yeah. And I, I wonder about that, a university right. like this. Are there? Yeah. Are there courses to interest people? In yeah, so we have a lot of STEM courses um, that you don't need to be a science student to enjoy. Um, all kinds of human, humanities students take courses in the STEM field. Um, they don't necessarily take the introductory survey for some you know, really challenging track that they're not interested in, but there's all kinds of STEM courses at Brown that non-specialists can take. Again, it, it getting good advising as to what those courses um, which ones they should take. I really recommend they go to the Science Center or meet with Dave Targan, um, who can help them find uh, those courses. Um, but I'll give you the example of the um, kitchen chemistry one that I mentioned. I knew a number of students who took that course uh, as a way in, but that's, just, that's actually a small course. It's just an example. Um, but there are all kinds of courses for non-specialists. Um, and of course, we have our wonderful SNC. You, you literally can't fail at Brown, right? So the, what other schools call pass-fail, you cannot fail here. So ours is called satisfactory, no credit. Um, but if a human, humanities student wants to take a STEM course and feels nervous, they want to use that as their risk-taking course, they should take it SNC. Uh, and that just removes the nervousness and the pressure that comes with trying something that you might be uncomfortable with. So I mentioned I went to a school with an open curriculum. I took a genetics course. It was actually a fairly high-level science course. I took it pass-fail. I passed. Uh, had I taken it for a grade, it wouldn't have been so good. But, but I learned a lot, and it was one of my favorite classes, precisely because I could do it that way. So we encourage students to do it that way. Just to reassure parents in the room, um, all our data shows that no matter what our students take, whatever division they focus in, they um, take courses across all three divisions. All students do. I mean. Statistically, I'm not saying there isn't an individual student who will miss this, um, but broadly speaking, all students will take courses in every division, even without being required to do so. So that's a really wonderful thing to know about the institution's open curriculum. So um, I know there are more questions. We have another session now that's going to focus on campus life issues, um, and I really encourage you to stay for that. But in the transition moments, or even in the hallway outside, if you have questions for me or for folks in, in the office on any of these programs I mentioned or other things, please feel free to come up. Thank you so much.